Justin Ray, I just love seeing you at the dock, that big old smile of yours. We've fished together for the last number of years, and it's so awesome to have you on the podcast today. Oh, yeah, man. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here with you all. Appreciate it. You know, you, um, you've got a big heart. You've got great friends. Everybody that I know that knows you loves you. They love fishing with you because, obviously, you're not only a passionate person, but you're a very successful um, fisherman with great versatility. But before we go there, um, when the last hurricane hit, was it Dorian? No, it was uh, Irma. Irma, the last one, yeah. yeah. I, I, you guys came around, you know, with chainsaws, helping people, delivering food. Um, all of the guides on Sugarloaf Key. Yeah. You know, you guys are an incredible family. And if you don't mind, I'm talking about the great fishing guides on that key. Right. Doug Kilpatrick, Willie Benson, Bobby Paulson, Bear and Travis Holman, Diego, Rulier, Timmy Carlisle, Pepe Lopez. What a family. Mm -hmm. You guys take care of each other. Oh, yeah. Tell me about you know what you guys did to help this small community when that storm hit. Well, you know, we all evacuate except for Diego. He's the crazy one that stayed. <laughs> and we, uh, we talked to him throughout the most of the hurricane until the back edge of the storm hit. I was talking to him. He had a cell, you know, had a satellite phone. And, um, when the eye went over her, the sugar loaf, which it did, the eye of the hurricane went directly over sugar loaf. He was outside and he's watching tarpon rolling in his canal. I'm talking to him on the phone and he's like, you know, it was unbelievable. Now it's flat calm, tarpon are rolling the canal. It's like, and the back edge of the storm is coming. When that back edge of the storm hit, I lost contact with Diego for two weeks. We didn't know what happened. Thought maybe he was dead or the whole sugar loaf is just wiped out. Cause they had, you know, the NOAA satellite chart was on, you know, the online and they blocked out from Big Coppet all the way to Marathon. It was blocked out. So we didn't know if we had a house to go back to or what. It was it was nuts. Blocked out meaning? Blacked out. They blacked, No communication. They had the NOAA satellite chart on there so you could see Key West up to Big Coppet. And you could, you could zoom in and see oh, houses yeah. and all that stuff, but they blacked out Big Coppet to Marathon. Oh and I God. just talked to Diego and I knew that the eye of the storm went directly over our, our sugar loaf. Right. So when that happened and we didn't have any contact for at least a week, it was just a gut wrenching feeling in your stomach. Like you just lost everything. The unknown. It was brutal. And your boats were there? No, I trailered the boats out of here. And so when you came back to your house, what were you left with? I was left with a giant mess. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about that mess. mess. What did it look like? <laughs> it looked like like hell. Um, like the forest had fallen on your was, house? Everything was brown. There was no leaves on any trees. It was just gross, disgusting. And, you know, Jared Raskob and the boys came down and actually cut my driveway out because they were the first ones in. They got in before we did. And Jared said he went down and cut my driveway out. I had three giant trees that fell across my driveway. And it was one silver palm and two buttonwoods. And he it, he came in and cut them out so we could drive in and be able to park the car at least. And when we got there, there was trees everywhere just falling all over the property. And, you know, my roof had barely any shingles left on it. The soffit was all gone underneath, you know, and the gutters were gone. And it was, it was a lot. Well, you recovered yeah. well. Yeah. And then last year we had COVID, mm -hmm. you know, what's, uh, what's the season been like now, you know, a year after COVID? I know last year the keys were all shut down. Last year during COVID, it was paradise. <laughs> it was good, wasn't it? It was awesome. We snuck in two weeks early. Was, we had a taste of it. It was fantastic. It was, we got to experience what it was like 50, 60 years ago. I mean, you could go up and down the road. You could go out on Highway 1 and just stand there and not see a freaking car. You know what I mean? We'll never see that again. Never. You go fish up by Bahionda Bridge and never hear a car go by. Wow. It was insane. And no other boats. There's no freaking pontoon boats running around. You go down to Key West and there was no Fury water sports, freaking parasail boats, jet skis running around 24th. There was nothing. You go through the harbor, it was just peaceful. Did you fun fish every day? 
I didn't fun fish every day because I got customers that lived here and I was able to keep working. But every day I had a chance to go fun fish, we went exploring to learn something new. What'd you find? I found so many good bonefish spots. <laughs> <laughs> Do you use them I, now? I left the tarpon alone because like, man, they get punished, you know. Those poor fish just get beat up. They're loved to death. Yeah. I know you all love them and I love them too, but not to the point where I just need to pick on them every day. So I let them go and swim and I went and fished spots that I never fished before because I had time, right? Because right. I don't want to fish fish that I'm going to go guide to or whatever. Like, so I just went and fished like every spot that I, you know, I've run into fish a tarpon spot over here that I fished for a bunch of years, like never fished that side, you know, and went over there and fished that and then went up inside and this side and just anywhere that will look good and start putting little pieces together where I found bonefish in this spot. I look for that bottom and go and do that. And I found some great stuff. I have mean, you seen, since you found these new spots, have you seen anybody fishing them? No. Other than you? One, maybe one other guy in one spot. And today I went into one of my secret, like really sneaky spots. Yeah. <laughs> Cause none of those guys were out there fucking fishing. Cause I don't want to go in there if somebody's going to see me go in there right. or come out of there. But today it's just windy enough. I got to go in there and it was fucking loaded with bonefish. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. It was loaded. You know, it's so deserving uh, of somebody like yourself who has been here for a long time and we'll get into that, but to find, have these little nuggets in your pocket that you can keep it's for yourself. Great. But I find that yeah, you've got to be very careful as to when you fish them otherwise it's gone look i mean there's been plenty of you know years running out of sugarloaf marina where i purposely didn't fish spots because i knew other guys were coming out and then you, you know, don't want to be seen all of a sudden they see you there and then they're there yeah well we were talking nice. about COVID a year ago you know i would just like to you know throw some love out to travis holman yeah, absolutely um thinking you know everybody him. who's watching this uh Travis is a great guide, uh, a brother of Bear. My he's, neighbor. Yeah, your neighbor. I mean, he's uh, in a induced coma. Every he's day. been in the hospital now for like three weeks, right? Yeah. Well. Staple of the community for for a long time. Yeah, well, here, here's here's to Travis, it's man. It's uh, a, yeah. yeah, and the whole family. Yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. For sure. Tell me about your family, Lauren and Ryan. Oh, God. <laughs> is that a no a good old, old a, god or a, a bad one. old god well the little crater getter is not so little anymore <laughs> he can pick you up the camel kid <laughs> the camel, camel kid. kid grew up i pulled that picture the other day it's so cute you guys both have your red pants on and your camo shirts and right <laughs> he's he's big now and he loves being on the water his favorite thing right now is spear fishing so we've been going out spear fishing because the hogfish season opened and you know you made me drive out to Marathon over the weekend and get him a reel for a spear gun. And oh, that's <laughs> oh, good. So, that's so he's cool. got the bug. Oh, he's and he's good at it. You know, he he's, came up with the biggest hogfish the other day. It was like, you know, 20 inch hogfish. I'm like, right. nice, dude. So, more so than fly fishing, he's gravitated towards oh, spear yeah. fishing. Yeah, because cool. he can't hear me yelling at him, I think, <laughs> <laughs> underwater. <laughs> T tell me about uh, you talk to me about your dynamic with your son fishing with him you know so because the, nikki and i have you yeah know, he's I'm, the only person i fish right. with right that's such a great relationship watching you all fish and i had an opportunity to fish with you when you're i don't know 17 yep. i think yep caught you god that was some of the best days of my life i mean caught your you hooked your first one in the flats and that day and that was fun. And then you took him diving. Yeah. Yeah. I went diving. Well, we went offshore. Went off, got tallfin. And, and then we went diving. Shot hogfish. Yeah. And then went to Lukey. <laughs> oh, my God. Shark almost took Justin, my fucking Justin, foot off. help. <laughs> I'm like, what do, you, what do you want me to do, bro? <laughs> Swim. <laughs> shark is circling him. You were the one chumming up the groupers and a shark came. Oh, well, that's what we do. <laughs> that was funny. How did you get into the sport? Obviously, you've brought uh, Ryan in, so, into the game. So, you know, game. teaching my son how to fish and appreciate the outdoors in our backyard that we live in has been the best. It's one of the, my best accomplishments is watching him grow up as a, as a fisherman. And what's really cool is watching him teach his friends what I've taught him. And he's super patient and he teaches his little friends like how to do this or do that and super good you know is and he learned it from me which is really cool and i get to pass that on to him 
that's one of my biggest accomplishments, I think. When I was, you know, working with Nikki when he was younger, once I realized he was connected, yeah. if he wasn't connected, I would have been more generous and kind and easy, you know, because right. I want him to, you know, stay in the game. But once I realized that the hook was already embedded, yeah, um, I was getting a little bit st- stern with him like a mentor. Mm. And he used to say, dad, why do you have to fucking yell at me? I said, look, you want to learn fast or you want to learn slow? <laughs> exactly. You know, I'm no longer a father son relationship. Mm-hmm. And I think you can appreciate that now, but I was used to say, look, don't drop that rod tip. You got to stop it, you yeah. know? And, and then he couldn't remember a knot. I'd showed him how to tie like six times. It's like, okay, you tie that knot on, or you're going to get back here and pull me the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the type of conversations right. we used to have. Yeah. What do you remember? I, I mean, Stern's a nice way to, to say you were an <laughs> asshole to me. <laughs> but, hey, that's <laughs> kind of how I Did you learn fast? Yeah, I did. But, okay. Yeah. That's how I am with all my guys. Like, you got, you're here for five days. Let's get that shit over with the first day, right? You're not going to fuck up the rest of the, the four days. Let's get it out of the way. You, you did that wrong, this wrong, and like, let's fix it now. Because at the end of the five days, that's it. You're gone for another year, right? So you want to you want to learn quick, you know, get and take advantage of all these shots that you're going to get the next, you know, all of them from here on out. So you kind of have to be in a way. What happens when your angler gets nervous knowing that you're going to be leaning on him? Do you have a tendency to feather it? Or, yeah, or stick with stick with the pressure. So permit fishing, a lot of times I go, well, here's a Jack Cravel. He's like 30 feet right there. See if you can hit him. Why don't just do it? And they make a perfect shot. The freaking fish eats it, and they're like, nice permit. I'm like, hey, nice permit. It's like what? What? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> that's <laughs> like, a great. Then that's they get nervous good. again. <laughs> I was like, what? what? <laughs> that's a great bait and switch. <laughs> so it's it's mental. Mostly oh, it's, it's mental. all mental. Yeah. Yeah. I fish guys in tournaments that could cast, you know, from here across the street and you get them in a tournament and they fucking forget how to cast. It's like, what are you doing? And it's just all in their head. You know what I mean? So what, what makes in your mind, what makes a great angler? One that, uh, can just slow everything down in their head and just make the cast, just treat it like another target, right? If you just treat every fish like a target, and just slow it down and make a good cast, you're gonna catch a lot of fish. But when they get all jacked up and freaking drinking Red Bull and shit on the boat, <laughs> it's like, Rrr. yeah, <laughs> I want it so bad. Right. Yeah. Then they, they, they fuck up. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I, I was playing golf with Darren Clark. Uh, I love Darren. He, Darren's yeah, I had him awesome. on the boat a couple of years ago. He's fantastic. He's a permit freak. A permit he? He freak. Is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we were playing golf together and I, you know, asked him, what do you tell your pro-am partners when they get really nervous and excited? Or when you have to make a big yeah. putt to win a major? He was saying that I would really try to work on my breathing where it might take 10 seconds for one breath and be conscious mm-hmm. of breathing, which I think can translate to, to fishermen. Absolutely. Just slow it down. And I notice too that whenever I do something poorly, I get too quick, whether it be a mm-hmm. backhand cast or, or a swing in a golf club, I get short and quick, a right. putting stroke, short and quick. But especially in fly casting in the wind, you've got to develop that backhand cast. And if you're quick, you get halfway. And then when you come forward, there's no there's no rod bend. Yeah. Uh, anyway, for our audience. <laughs> yeah. It's in 10 breathe. seconds. Breathe. <laughs> Take a breathe, second baby. and breathe. <laughs> um, <laughs> is there you know i'd like to just kind of focus on on permit if you don't mind because you've won you know the dell brown four times um i feel that anyone can get lucky and win one tournament yeah as an angler and as a guide All right and the great ones can back it up you've backed it up yeah what makes you such a great permit guide i don't know i love them and i hate them <laughs> Do you, is it because I, you spend more time i spend a lot of a lot of time fishing for a permit because i can be by myself right i love being by myself I, I search out areas to be by myself and with permit like you know they're here on a certain tide for an hour or less and then they're off that spot so you got to move to the next spot and keep mo- moving around and to link all that up together to have a solid day of getting shots you, you got to know Every spot, every flat, 
where they come from, where, where they're coming and where they're going to and try to intercept them in those areas. And I spent just a shitload of time doing it. I know. It sounds complicated. It's paid off, you know, with the Del Brown. Won it four times and got second three times. Yeah, right. And, um, in 10 years. Yeah. You guys dominated. And we caught a lot of fish. I mean, we caught seven. We caught six. Caught seven again this last year and tied with Willie. We both caught seven. And we that's got second. Lot. That's a lot of <laughs> fish in three I mean? days. Fuck yeah, that's a lot of fish wow. in three days. And, uh, you know. It's just if you're if you love to do something, you put your whole heart into it. You're gonna get good at it, you know. My dad always told me, he's like, you want to get good at something, you surround yourself with people that are better than you at it. So when we bought the house on Sugarloaf, I was in the mecca of permit fishing. I got what year was this? Uh, we bought the house in '04, and there, you know, I walked into Sugarloaf Marina. I look on the counter, and there's you know Dustin Huff with Del Brown, the giant freaking permit on the counter you know steve huff's there and with his boats with his truck in the canal <laughs> even god has a bad day yeah. <laughs> remember that photograph <laughs> and then you you know timmy carlisle like not that he's a fly guy but man he's he knows more about you know fishing around the lower keys than anybody and uh doug kilpatrick and diego and Chris Supley was on a roll like back then. I mean, he was killing all the Dell Browns. I think he won three in a row, or and then the he you know maybe two Dell Browns and a March Merkin or something. He was just killing it and just try to surround myself with those people and just you know shit's gonna rub off on you. What kind yeah. of conversations do you have when you sit at the table with all those guys? We didn't talk about much fishing. We just drank beer and. <laughs> <laughs> Hung out with our customers. That was, those are the good days, you know. Um, are permit fishermen and anglers and guides really persnickety with cutting their flies off before they get to the dock and not speaking about what they're using and new fly designs? Because I remember yeah. when I used to fish with Dustin. I only fished one Del Brown with him. Right. But we used to always cut our flies off before we got to the dock. Mm -hmm. Do you all still do that? Um. Yeah. Is your fly quite a bit different? <laughs> is your fly quite a bit different than all the others? I think it is. <laughs> okay, but I use yes, no. I use, I use several different flies. I mean, the permit eat flies. It's really not the arrow so much as the Indian. If you have a good Indian on the bow, he's going to make that shot. You know, and the more shots you make, the more more transitions into a fish. A lot of times, you know, how to feed it. The guys that are really good at it, like they can see little things that other guys can't. And if I'm on the back of a boat in a tournament and I got to tell you where the fish is and how to fish it, we're already done. done. We're no toast. Chance. We got no chance. So the guys that are really good, like, you know, I Greg Vincent and now Jose, you can, those guys are badasses. They can see, they can cast. I mean, you just say 10 o'clock, 80 feet. You got them. Yeah. And half the time, I don't even have to say that. He already sees them, you know, right. like the Jose I'm fishing now, he fucking guy can see four. Hey, Josh. 400 feet out there. You see him tailing? I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> like, where, he does that with, with where, me. Where? Five minutes later, I see it. I'm like, holy, how far? I'm like, but I'm looking in here, right? Here, here's my area. And he's looking way the fuck. But he, he, he sees him good. Right. Is, is there any guy you converse with and, and talk about improving the game and what you guys can do better as as guides and i don't really talk to other guides very much i live in a bubble man i put the boat in my neighbor's backyard and i don't go to the marina no more and i just do my own thing so i talk to my customers a lot about it on the water you know have you become a recluse i don't think so i still like hanging out with people but i just just over you know, beers over beers and stuff the, the water has gotten so crowded you know and just there's so many people and so many eyeballs out there. I just, it, you know, if you get on a good fishing spot, it's, you almost feel like you're always looking over your shoulder going, fuck, I hope nobody sees me in here, you know, like, right. Cause I know they're going to be sitting here the next day just cause they saw me, you know, I'm a pretty easy target and I'm fucking six foot four and right. you know, two thirty. So I was like, Hey, there's Justin. Right. So the Let's year go. after COVID that hit last year and the keys were shut down, it's magnified times. Oh, <sighs> Yeah, you see it right now, yeah. I see it in Colorado, too. Yeah. Yeah. What's the future look like for you guys? Hmm. Oh, man, I don't know. 
I'm going to keep bone fishing <laughs> <laughs> during tarpon season because nobody's seeing me. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. But what happens if you have tarpon guys that want to go catch the big fish? Well, we do that. Yeah. And then, you yeah. know. Have you always been passionate towards, I mean, you're talking about your ADD. How does that play a role when you're out on the water? Oh, shit. I got fishing ADD. Bad. So, <laughs> so what happens? What's, what's, what's churning in your mind? Give me an example of, of what you're thinking. Well, if you're sitting on the ocean and it's dying to go do something else, you know, like. You can't just, wait. I can't, can't wait, wait for fish. Yeah. Right? I hate waiting for fish. I want to go find them. Right. I want to go seek them out and find them, you know, feeding in their, in their environment. I don't want to sit there waiting for one to swim into me. Right. You know, so I'm always like trying to do other stuff. Like I had Mike Lawson down here who I worked for on the Henry's Fork and South Fork of the Snake in my career out there. And he's a fly fisherman, you know, never spin fished or whatever. I got him to go handline line Jewfish out of the trees one day. Really? <laughs> With mullet. How much fun is that? <laughs> you were giggling like schoolboys. I want to do that. <laughs> It was hilarious. We've tried that a little bit with Dustin. Oh, it's so fun. Yeah. Not hand lining, but we got our arms yanked the off. The only way you can get them out of the trees is mono a mono. Right. 300 pound test. Freaking pull on those suckers. Put skid marks on the bow of your boat. <sighs> it's fun as heck. Yeah. What, did, did you ever think about dabbling in the tarpon tournaments? Because you, you were dominating the perma tournaments. Yeah, I and thought you about never, it. You did. But you know, like the whole time you got, you're all doing the tarpon tournaments, it takes pressure away from here. So I get to run my program. I get out there first, you know, or I can run out to the West or do this or that. It just seems like it's, I get a little bit more uh, secluded, you know, because you all can't run so far in a day. Like I know where to go and get, have it to myself a little bit. Right. And I've always appreciated that. I thought fishing the tarpon tournament, you're going to go up there. You're going to run your truck up there, have to launch at the Lorelei run all the way back down here to my area where I fish. Now it's going to be crowded and then I got to run all the way back up there and then come home and then do it all again for five days for not that much more pay. It's like, man, I'd rather have a really good customer that appreciates it and we can go do our own thing. And at the end of the day, like putting more money in the bank and don't have to deal with all that shit. Right. Yeah, <laughs> you know? no, I get it. Right. No, Just, it's, it's not so yeah. much of a priority. No, nah, not yeah. really. Yeah. But you still want to continue in the permit tournaments? Yeah, I'll do it for a little while longer, maybe. I'm kind of. Do you feel any burn coming? Feeling no, not burnout, but just I don't know. I'm just not that mad at them anymore. It's not more, not about tournament fishing that much anymore. It's, well, you've proven yourself. Yeah, too. I think you know. I, I really to- wanted to prove myself and be part of the history of the Keys, and I thought you know, getting my name on that. Del Brown trophy would be pretty cool. And, yeah, no kidding. You know, Del Brown was the man, and well, it's a great you know, uh, tournament to win. You know, absolutely. Unlike the March Merkin, even though it's a great permit tournament, I, you know, I too wanted to win the Del Brown because of yeah, his of his name, his yeah. legacy. You know, hundred percent. How how uh, so? The Angler's Journal had that article, the permit whisperer. Yeah. <laughs> What's it feel like to, <laughs> to see your face in in magazines? As you know, yeah, it's, as it's, a celebrity guide. <laughs> <laughs> you know more about it than me. <laughs> <laughs> it feels damn good. It does. No, it feels like it, you it, know all your hard work justifies the the means. You know, like you put in all your effort, all the hard work, all your blood, sweat, and tears, and to get recognized for doing that, it means a lot. Yeah. For sure, it's confirmation. It's coming yeah. from somebody else. Yeah, it's not an Instagram post that you right. posted. Yeah, tell me about your new boat. Uh, or actually, you've had a Chittim now for what, uh, a couple, this is two, my three years? third season on it. Yeah, I mean, we just got ours. And yeah, it's fantastic. How's it changed your fishing? Um, so I started fishing um, my customer Ivar Bolander's boat. He just he had gotten one, and it's all mostly carbon with the seventy on there. And we were out permit fishing one day, and it was slick calm, and we had permit tailing out 120 feet. And I'm like, you cast now. It's like, I can't make the shot. I'm like, all right, I'll take another pull. Push, you know, 20 feet closer. I'm like, take it now. He's like, still too far. I'm like, they're going to blow. Because I'm used to fishing my Maverick, right? And they feel that boat. They felt it. And like, another push pull. You know, now we're in we're in 90 feet. I'm like, do it. It's like, I can't. I'm like, all right, one more push pull. Now we're like six, you know, we're 70, 80 feet. 
by the time I the, actually made the shot, we're at 60 feet and they're still tailing. They didn't feel us at all. And like, bam, got them. Like, so oh, you shit. you got a whole new level like, of confidence. Now it's going to cost me freaking another 50 grand after I sell my <laughs> Maverick. <laughs> so you don't think your Maverick could have done that? Oh, shit. They'd feel me right way out really? there. On a slick, calm day. Hell yeah. These fish now, pretty much, we had them today. We are staked out on the ocean. They were swimming almost under the boat, staked out slap in the back of the boat and they're swimming like literally five feet off the side coming wow. by us i'm like there's one <laughs> you can't imagine that a boat yeah. would make that kind of difference but you, that's you fantastic see yeah especially pulling as much as we do like just wear and tear on your your hands your wrists your elbows your you know shoulders everything just so much easier right. and it's really quiet i mean super quiet it's a game changer and it's stable I mean, the stability on that boat is amazing. Yeah. You, know, you get two guys on there and it's still really stable. I've fallen off a dolphin super <laughs> skip three times. I bet. I'd hook a tarpon and Kevin Guerin would spin the back of the boat uh-huh. out. I'd, I'd get launched. Yeah. You step off the spine. It's just like so tippy. Uh-huh. And I had some pretty decent balance back then. Right. You know. Um, but yeah, I, I love ours as well. What um, in the tarpon world, a big transformation in to be able to successfully catch tarpon was the uh, the advent of the worm fly and double handed stripping. Yeah, and now everybody's doing that. Right. Is there anything in the in the permit world that was a game changer, a fly design, or anything like that, or a stripping, or reading the the fish in any way that would dictate what to do? Waiting. You know, yeah, waiting. waiting's come in handy just because on those calm days, they're so hard to get close to you. Like, you know, the Chittim now helps me get closer to the fish. Um, it, it, every fish is different, a little different, right? I mean, with permit fishing, if they're head down, they're they're mudding, then you want to use one technique. If they're kind of swimming. And what would that technique be? So, you know, the plop and drop, a crab or something that's going to sink down their face and get down to their level. And strip. You know, just and then just it. like slide it just slow, you know, easy. And that distance is usually like here. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's just a, you know, long, then, slow strip, but, whatever. But drop that fly like an arm's length right here in front of the fish. Yeah. It depends on how deep they are and what, the, what the current is doing. But yeah, mm-hmm. you want it to, you don't want it to sink down and knock them on the head, but you want it to sink down in their face somewhere where they can see it in their, in their plane of vision. And then when they're swimming, which they do a lot now, they don't mud as much as they used to. And, then you want kind of a stripping fly to kind of come by them a little More bit. like a shrimp fly? Yeah. Why do you think that is? You know, I've been trying to figure that out for a long time. I think we had a lot of red algae growing on the flats for a long time that really covered up a lot of the turtle grass. And I think it kind of choked out some of the crabs and whatnot. And then after Irma, a lot of that shit blew out, but now it's starting to grow back. I've been seeing it lately. And it's choking out the turtle grass again. And, and you know, we've had so many, you know, near disasters down here. It was like the BP oil spill and fucking hurricanes and this and that. And just a constantly changing behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. I and mean, you know, 15 years ago, you could go out and find waves of permit coming and you go out and get 20 shots on a bad day almost. And now it's like, you know, six, eight shots is a good day, you know, and a lot harder now, not as many, you know, fish around. But I'm almost envisioning that a tailing permit is not moving very fast. No. So you have time to get that crab to the bottom and actually, you know, almost force feed him and not force feed him, but allow that fish to find your boat. Mm -hmm. Whereas if the fish, the permit is sliding and moving, you bring out the jack of the permit right. hypothetically and you, you put it out there and, and, you know, strip it a little bit quicker mm. then they can react to what they're seeing since they're traveling. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, that's what we do in Mexico. You know, we, I go down there and do a permit camp every summer and we fish a lot of shrimp down there because the fish aren't tailing so much as riding on the top and moving a little bit. And so we're fishing shrimp real fast, you know, short strips, bump, 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 bump. Kind of like a worm fly that you, quick. I've caught them doing the worm strip. Right. Especially the little schoolies, like the faster, the better. Put it under your arm and just strip like crazy and get those little guys because they eat it so quick and spit it out. You know what I mean? Where the bigger fish, they'll eat it and you'll get 
skin on the inside of the lip. Those little ones you hit the crusher and they make you sh- watch them <laughs> push blow it, it out quick as shit. We had yeah. a tarpon the other day on the, on the on the beach. He came up and I had. Uh, these guys who own a big ranch in Montana and they allow us to elk hunt up there. So I trade them, you know, four nice. days of tarpon fishing to elk hunt and they're kind of newbies and he threw a shrimp pattern in there and he's bumping it, bumping it, bumping it. And his tarpon came up and he went like this, like to the microphone to eat it. And, <laughs> and he stopped stripping it and he went, <laughs> it's like he yawned on the shrimp. <laughs> like, oh. Ducked his head and turned around. Oh, no. All he needed was an inch, <laughs> just an inch, you know? <laughs> Uh, but it's such a great game we play with these fish. Do you ever see a fish that that you know is that you're going to catch before you catch it? Sometimes. And what does that fish look like? Relaxed. And happy. Like, it's like a like yeah. a tarpon sliding nice and high and happy slow. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So so happy meaning I mean I don't I haven't done a lot of permit fishing but tail wagging a little yeah, bit like not you know on a when it's blowing freaking 20 out there and you can sneak up behind them you know, down current of him and he's laying there in front of you with his tail and he's just working up current. I'm like, this guy's dead. I'm going to get this one, <laughs> you know, slide in behind him being real quiet and just get the, get an angle on it. Just get it up above him just a little and let it come down. Those, those fish are, you know, those ones are going to eat it. And, and most of your fly designs are still crabs. Yeah. Shrimp and crabs or shrimp crabs. and crabs. Yeah. You know, I fished with Jared Rouskop on a show recently is the first time I've ever seen this and fishing with Dustin for permit. We've, d- we've done that before, mm-hmm. you know, fishing in, you know, behind a permit that's feeding in, into the current that's coming the tide, you know, hook it around or whatever. But with Jared the other day, we had this really big fish in calm water laid up on the bottom. Mm. I've never seen, I've heard this, but I've never seen it. So we're behind the fish, and I've never thrown over the back of a tarpon ever. That's like yeah, a cardinal right. rule, right? Never do, yeah. So he usually fishes clear lines, and I had a, a ghost tip, which is nine feet and a 15 foot leader. So I had 20 some feet. He said, throw it right over the top of that tarpon. He's going to hate you for this. No, everybody knows. He's, he's got a TV show. <laughs> he's going to hate you. He's got a this. TV show. He's got 50,000 people <laughs> I mean, that are going to see it. Yeah, but he doesn't describe how to do it. Jared, I love you. <laughs> Anyway, he throws, throws it way out there, lets it sink all the way to the bottom, and then you just bring it real, real slow. Hmm. All of a sudden, you see this big fish turn around. It's a 140-pound <laughs> fish, clear water. Yeah, nice. I've never seen anything. But Jared was saying, look, shrimp don't swim into the current, as right. neither do crabs. So a lot of times they're coming down current if they're in the current. Yeah. And the so fish they, are always laying into the current. Into the current. Yeah. It's like a smorgasbord. They may be laid up, but they're, you know, maybe laying their feeding a little bit, especially permit. So it makes total sense. Yeah. Just can't be super aggressive with your strip. You got to make it chill. Just keep it coming with the current. Yeah. If you ever come back as a shrimp in your next life, just fucking attack everything. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never get eaten. <laughs> That's good. Oh, how funny is that? Well, it was funny um, listening to uh, Steve Huff's interview, talking, not even in the, in the interview, but just speaking with Steve a long time ago. He was talking about how anal uh, Dell was with the permit fishing. It would be a perfect March day, slicked off calm oh, yeah. and hot, and tarpon are laid up everywhere. And Dell would not go tarpon fishing. Even though Dell holds the eight pound tarpon record at 127 pounds, <laughs> right. he would not go tarpon fishing. And Steve, you say, Dell, you got to do me a favor. Yeah. Just let me flop one. Just let me flop one. He'd go into the seaplane <laughs> base and take one cast, flop one, and go, oh, now I feel better. And then they'd go permit fishing. <laughs> I what? fished, I fished John Ain one time and he's the same way. We had, yeah, we had a big, you know, tarpon laying on this edge of this channel. I'm like, hey, you see the tarpon? I'm like, throw out that. And he goes, but there's a permit on the other side and he bombed it over the tarpon and catches the permit. I'm like, no oh, shit. Holy shit. Good for him. I'm like, I mean, some guys got it and some guys, you know, some guys got it. What is it about, you know, I mean, a lot of people love bonefish and, and, and tarpon. And I know too, that when the big bonefish were around, there were a lot of guys that were crazy about big bonefish yeah. fishing exclusively. Mm-hmm. What is it about the permit guys that are so crazy about permit? 
What yeah. makes him so I insane? Know, like, You're not that way, are you? Are you just, insane about him? No, I mean, I'm not insane. A, you do have a tattoo on your ankle. I mean, I love him, and I'll, I fish for him a lot. But like, if I know the conditions aren't right for a permit, or there's not a bunch around, I'll go, I'll go bone fishing, you know, right. or I'll go tarpon fish, or do this or that. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not that like that. I mean, like, you know, I took you out dolphin fishing and right. hog fishing, and well, that's what I was gonna say. You're, you're a total waterman. You know, you love to you love to kite surf, yep. spear fish, go offshore. I mean, the other day, we, you know, we saw yeah. you at Sugarloaf Marina. You were going right. offshore and trying to catch wahoo and yep. dolphin, and you just love it all. I do, which is really cool to see because that's where my ADD kicks in. It's like fuck. you have options. <laughs> at least you have options. No, it's good out there. Like we got to try that. See, like, hey, Dickie and I have ADD, but we only know how to tarpon fish. <laughs> <laughs> so then we just start yelling at each other. <laughs> How important was it for um, the fishing game to shut down Western Dry Rocks? We're, we'll see. A couple of years, we'll see. Are you encouraged? I am. Yeah. But I, I, I got a dead permit on my doorstep last April, so it's a little touchy much. subject to me. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a threat to me and my family that I didn't appreciate and you better not fucking, if I find out who you are, <laughs> yeah. you're in trouble. Look, you've got to do the right thing. You've yeah. got to think about conservation and There's, saving and preserving the resource. Absolutely. And if it's the right thing to do, I don't care who you are. Yeah. If that's the only place you know where to go catch a permit yeah. while they're spawning on the Western Dry Rocks, you suck. Yeah. Go find them somewhere yeah, else. Yeah, you know, and if you got 10 guys going out there a day and they're saving their days, they're, they're, they're hooking 10 permit and maybe catching one, they're, the rest are getting eaten by sharks. It's like, is that an ethical thing to do is go out there and fish that shit? Like if I'm fishing around the back and I, I have sharks around me and fish, I'll catch one and get the hell out of there, you know, before right. fish gets eaten. Because once that fuck, once that shark eats one, then he's going to be there always, right? You just program them to stay there and eat, like Pavlov's right. dog. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, the sharks are definitely a problem. Yeah, there's a lot of theories out there why they got so bad. But um, well, I think the biggest theory is that since we no longer have longliners, you know, collecting them, yeah. killing sharks, there's going to be an abundance of them. Well, that and the I heard the BP oil spill, a dispersant they put in the water. Like shortly after that, even the guys up in Vero Beach, like Mike Holiday's, like. The sharks were showing up after that because it pushed all the sharks out of that area. And now we got them all up here. Oh, no kidding. So that's another one. But. Yeah. Have you seen the permit, you know, here in New Mexico and Belize? Do you see them act differently upon yeah. each region? Absolutely. And how so? Well, in Mexico, they don't tail as much in the shallow. They don't have a lot of current flow because we're fishing up in Extension Bay, you know, so they, they float around up on top. One of the coolest things I've seen is like they'll follow bonefish around, school and bonefish when they mud because the bonefish are there and the, the shrimp get scared to the surface and the permit are up top eating them. So if, <laughs> if you throw a fly with any weight on it and it sinks down past, you know, the, the surface film, you catch a 14-inch bonefish. But if you use a floating fly and you skate it on top, you get the permit. It's kind of like a bonefish on rays or per kinda, permit on rays. Yeah. Well, similar, but yeah. Yeah. Are, are they are they easier to catch? Harder to catch? What's um, they're still permit. I mean, they're a little easier to catch just because you can you can strip the fly more. Whereas here, you have to read the fish more and you know not move the fly so much, so you're not tight a lot of times. You got to watch them eat it. And is it very similar fishing? Like if you if you have a good day in Mexico versus a good day in Key West, are you getting similar shot counts or? Well, sometimes. Still permit fishing. Every day is different. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's go back to your introduction to fishing. Sure. Who introduced you to fishing? How did you get involved? My mom is a diehard um, trout angler. She's guide. She's a guide. In Bishop, California, um, she was always loved fishing. Like one of my first memories, I was in the backpack, you know. And mom goes down to land a trout with her net, and I go flying out of the backpack. <laughs> she remember to, that she had to net the trout and me. <laughs> <laughs> that's so I, awesome. I learned a lot with her. Like that's how I got started. I did my first guide trip with her, and uh, I worked with this guy all day, and he ended up handing me twenty bucks. And I was like, holy shit! How old were we then? 
I was uh, 23. Yeah. Yeah. And you were still in Bishop. I was in, I was living in Lake Tahoe at the time. My mom's in Bishop's just three hours away. Right. And uh, Lake that, Tahoe is a great place. I was a game changer. Yeah, I won my last downhill there. I skied 100 days a year and fished <laughs> all summer. She <laughs> jumped off those cliffs with Scott Schmidt. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was there. I was there. Do you the, fish the Truckee in, uh, Lake, in Pyramid Lake absolutely. for the big La Junta Cutthroat? Yeah. Yeah, I used to go out there yeah. as well. Pretty fun. How did you get to the Keys? So I was in uh, Jackson Hole, Wyoming on New Year's Day in, uh, it was 02. It was nine, degree, nine degrees outside. I opened a Corona and it fucking froze from the top down. <laughs> and I had just gone through a divorce. I was like, fuck this. I ain't sitting in Jackson Hole all winter. So I just basically the next day loaded up my truck and started driving. Ended up going through Texas, Louisiana, and all the way down the west coast of Florida and ended up down here. Did you know anyone down here? I knew uh, Brett Novick. He was a guide with me up in Idaho, and he'd been down the year or two before and kind of came down, palled around with him a little bit. So you were you were a, a, a trout guide for yeah. the summers up there. Okay, yeah. gotcha. And then getting divorced, I was like, you know, I uh, had to do something different. Right. And I met Lauren down here, and that was it, you know. It was been, been home, with her. home sweet. Home. <laughs> what do you call a fishing guide without a girlfriend? Homeless. <laughs> <laughs> well, Justin, it's been great having you hey, on the thanks. podcast. You are a good man. Thanks so much for having me. You know, cheers. You, Justin, you've got such cheers. great love and great inspiration. Appreciate it's you. Some all. of the yeah. best days on the water I've, I've had with you, and I, I appreciate it. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, man. Let's do it again. I'd love to. Cheers. Absolutely. Bro. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> thanks, Nikki. Justin. Sorry for yelling all those years. <laughs> it worked, though. Ryan Ray, I, I promise I won't yell at you so much. <laughs> <laughs> now that he's got it. <laughs> now that he's okay. That's right. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Thank you, guys. When I saw it's West Side Story When I saw it's just a ride When I saw it's